Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Hey, welcome. So glad that you're here at FaithBridge today. We're going to continue a series that we started last week. We're calling it Joy Full. And we're going to go back to the text we've been working in. This is the book of Philippians. So you can go there in your Bible. That's in the New Testament. Don't be afraid to use the table of contents. If you need a Bible, flag down one of the ushers. They're coming in both the rooms right now. And you can raise your hands and they'll be glad to let you borrow one of those. And you can turn to Philippians, and we're going to go to chapter 1 in just a few minutes. So some uh, years ago, I went on my first cross-cultural mission experience. Uh, It was with a group of, of, uh, uh, of other brothers and sisters in Christ, and we were in the poor, very poor area of Mexico. And we had gone there to build some homes. We call them homes, but coming from where we came from, they looked more like huts. And, but we gave our all, uh, threw ourselves into it for that whole week. And it was a very powerful week. At the very end of which though, I remember standing there looking uh, at the hut that I had, the house that I had been working on, thinking to myself, I don't know if I could pull my Camry into this, let alone two cars could not fit in this. And yet, I noticed something. These people were so grateful. They were hugging us. They were so excited. They just had joy on their faces. Their little kids are just joyful running all around and, and, and just have naked in, in their little, all, anything but new hand-me-down kind of clothes that they're wearing. They're offering us food at the end of the week. And I was thinking to myself, you know, it's interesting these people have so little in the way of the stuff that we have so much of, and yet they have so much of the joy that I see so little of over here where we have so much. I was thinking about how, how I mean, most all of us who are hearing my voice right now, you have dependable shelter, you live in an apartment or maybe a home that you rent or maybe that you own a home right? And you, many of you, most of you perhaps own a car, maybe two, even three. And a lot of us, we even have an, a house that's probably 10 times better what we built, a house that we actually just build to keep our cars and our bicycles in. And that's just normal for us. And so you look at all the stuff that we have and you would think we of all people should be the most joyful people, right? Ah, contraire. That's not the way it works. Here in America, statistics show running at all times highs are depression and a sense of desperation and a sense of discouragement and dismay, dejection, all of these things are, are running rampant through our country that has so much. So what's the answer? I'm afraid many of us say, well, I gotta get out and hustle harder and work more and get some more stuff because finally, if I get enough stuff, then finally, I'm gonna feel that good feeling on the inside. That's not the way it works, though. New stuff brings a sense of happiness and might last a few hours, maybe a few days. But then it wears off. There's not any sense of abiding, ongoing joy that comes from the stuff of life, is there? But the Bible says there is a deep, abiding sense of joy that is available to every single one of us. It's there for the taking. It's there for the enjoying all the time. That's what we're talking about in this series. So, how do we get it? I'd like some of that, please. No better person for us to learn from than the Apostle Paul, whose letter to the Philippians we've been looking at here, um, well, since the turn of the new year, really. And um, let's just remind ourselves who this man was. 
He was one of the great leaders of the early original Christian church. But that's not how he had started out. So you remember, he started out an adversary of Christianity. He hated the Christians. In fact, he'd even given himself over to killing the Christians. But then one day God broke through to him and he met Jesus memorably in that road to Damascus. And that was the day he was transformed. And he became a follower of Jesus, said, I'm giving my all to following after you and I'm gonna help other people come to know you for the rest of my days. And he would indeed spend the rest of his years traveling all around the Mediterranean region. And he was a church planter, meaning that he would go and he would start a church in a little place like Philippi that we're reading a letter that he corresponded with them or Colossa or Corinth or, or so on. He was going around and he was starting all of these churches. And we get to read these letters because many of them comprise what is our New Testament. And, but so what you have to know uh, to really appreciate what's going on in this text today is that Paul had one dream of all dreams after he became a Christian, and that is that someday he would preach in Rome, the center of the universe back then. Oh, to be able to finally get to Rome and to get to tell the gospel, to tell what Jesus did in my life and how he changed me and saved me and transformed me and gives me joy. He couldn't wait to do that in Rome. But God had a different plan in mind. Paul got to Rome all right, but he got there as a prisoner. So for two years, he would remain chained to guards 24-7, daily waiting his trial that might come finally before Emperor Nero. And he'd never done anything wrong other than follow Jesus and tell other people about him. And yet somehow, despite these circumstances that he was in, Paul never loses his joy. This is why we've got to learn from him. Let me read to you from Philippians 1, starting at verse 12. And we'll go from there. Verse 12, I want you to know, he writes to the Christians in Philippi, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So to become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord and by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word, to speak the word without fear. Now jump down to verse 18b. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this is going to turn out for my deliverance, as it's my eager expectation and hope that I'll not be at all ashamed but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, if there is anybody who could have justifiably written a letter saying, help, I have done nothing wrong at all. This is outrageous. I am strapped, shackled, chained to a guard 24 seven. I don't eat in privacy. I don't sleep in privacy. I don't even go to the bathroom in privacy. This is unthinkable what I'm going through. I deserve better than this. If anybody could have had the right to write something like that, Paul could have, but that's not what he wrote. It's not how he responds at all. Why? Because I think he understood three things that I wanna make sure that we leave here today understanding. I'll give them to you as we go through, all right? The first one is this. Paul understood lasting joy is unrelated to our circumstances. Lasting joy is unrelated to our circumstances. Because as good as your circumstances might be in one season, they'll be less desirable in another season. Circumstances may make for a terrible compass for our emotions. But the person of Jesus Christ, the person who has Jesus Christ residing within him, residing within her, that person is never a hostage to his or her circumstances. The follower of Jesus can always see beyond the circumstances that he or she is going through. And so this is how Paul could write his Philippians friends saying, look, you don't need to worry about me. 
Don't be discouraged because of what's happening. In fact, I'm full of joy, and I want you to be as well. Clearly, Paul was operating at an altogether different higher level than we tend to operate, especially when we're on the freeway and somebody cuts us off and we're fuming at that person or we're yelling at somebody at home or yelling at somebody at work or yelling at the TV about the politics and things that are going on in the world. And meanwhile, Paul, he just has this calm, collected posture. Even though he's fastened to a member of the Royal Guard coming in every four hours for a changing of the guards, six different men per day over the course of 24 hours for two entire years. Yet he's writing about joy. You can have joy. He's showing us your mindset is what matters, not your circumstances. I'm sure it didn't take Paul very long to calculate. He's an evangelist. Don't you know he began to calculate? Wait, I love to tell people the good news. That's what I live to do. And every four hours, I get a new captive audience. Um, yeah, it, I, it, it's not so much that I'm chained to them as they're chained to me. And so what more could an evangelist ask for? A captive audience who's handcuffed right there to him. You just picture him saying when the, when the, when the next guard comes in, hi, sir, hi. So I know how this works. You're going to be chained to me uh, for the next four hours. So I might as well make the time count since you'll probably never come back in here again. So I was just wondering, what do you know about God? Well, I don't know much about God. Well, I got to tell you, let me tell you, I got some good news for you. See, a lot of people think that God is far off and he's distant and he's impersonal. He doesn't care. The great God of the universe made the universe and packed out of here. But that's not true. I used to actually sort of think that myself, but then one day I discovered that God became personal. In fact, so personal that he looked down upon this world that's so full of sin and destruction and evil and death and suffering. He said, I'm not going to pack out of here. I'm going to come in closer. And he put on flesh and blood. And that was Jesus, his only son. He came into this world, Jesus Christ, the Savior. And he lived the life of sinless perfection that you, sir, you'll never live. I haven't lived it either. And then Jesus died the death of suffering. He died the death of punishment you and I both deserve. But then he triumphed over the grave on the third day. And I'm telling you, if, sir, you would attach yourself to this Jesus, your life could be transformed before they unstrap you for the next guy coming in here. You could go out of this cell with a heart full of life, with a soul full of joy. Would you like to trust in Christ? I just imagine that he had these kind of conversations because he understood that joy, it's, it's unrelated to your circumstances. It has everything to do with the one to whom you're connected. For several years, um, back in the day, I journeyed up to one of the maximum security prisons, men's security prisons, um, north of Huntsville. I was part of a prison ministry. We would go in every month for several hours, and we would mentor some of the Christian inmates. And I found it to be a very fascinating and fulfilling experience. Did it for, I don't know, three or four years. We would drive up and we would wait in a long line, go through the identification process, which is rigorous. And then finally, after we would all get our clearance, um, they would you know, frisk us down to make sure we're not taking anything. And, and then we would file, single file, the way they told us to walk uh, behind an officer and we'd be cleared to go through the first barbed wire electric fence and then the second one. And then finally we'd go into the, to this cavernous um, prison. And, and I remember the scent would just hit you right when you walk in. It just, it was so smelly. It just smelled like death. And you'd go in, it was this feeling of oppressiveness, this feeling of heaviness. 
And we would follow the officer and we'd go down some long corridors and we'd go up a stairwell or two. And then finally we'd get to the door that he would unlock and he'd open the door and we'd go into the one place that had light in the whole prison. That was the chapel. And the, the two dozen of us or so that would go, we would spread ourselves out and we'd sit out, uh, out in the, the chapel that seated about 100 people and we would wait. And about five or 10 minutes later, they would release the Christian inmates to come to chapel voluntarily. And they'd begin coming in. And I'm telling you, you would see when they came around that corner, such hugging, high-fiving, laughter, reunioning with people. Uh, it, it was, I remember my first time, I was like, I have never seen anything like this, but I'm coming back. This is a moment. And so they're coming in, and before long, we're all locked, shouldered. I mean, I've never been lock-armed singing praise songs with such tatted-up, big, burly, muscular, toothless guys. And they're just, they're just singing the songs of the Lord out. They're praising, tears coming out their eyes. They're just so grateful and so, so excited. And, and I'm, it was a moment. And we would worship, and then the, the chaplain would give us a little message. We'd listen to the word preached, and then he'd put us into our little clusters of two and three, and, and we would begin to encourage one another just using the word and praying for one another. And I remember how my soul would get sort of sad at the end of uh, the evening when it was about, they, they would announce 10 more minutes, 10 more minutes, you need to be moving towards your prayer time now and your final words. And so we'd pray for one another, and we'd hug, and see, see you next month when I get to come back in. And I'm telling you, those people would go out filled, but we would go out filled as well. Because when you're in a place where everything has been stripped away, I'm telling you, people are desperate. But when they find Jesus, they have everything they need because Jesus can't be stripped away from them. I saw it with my own eyes. He was with them, even in the darkness of those circumstances, even the darkness of that prison. He was giving them joy regardless. Now, I don't know what circumstances that you're going through, or at least some of you, I don't know what circumstances that, that any number of you are going through in your lives right now. But I do know this, you can have joy even in the midst of your circumstances, if you could just get to Jesus. You've just got to get to Jesus. And not just to him personally, but get to the people of God. Get to the people of Jesus. That's why we are here every single week, right? That's why we have small groups that I don't know, a couple thousand or so of you are involved in because we understand that the circumstances of life are always gonna press in upon us. It's always gonna be overwhelming and burdensome, and we have to have the light and the joy that comes through Jesus Christ. That's why we gather, that's why we sing our songs, that's why we cluster in fellowship. If you're not there, I encourage you to be there and to get there, because your soul needs it. I get sad whenever I hear somebody say, you know, our lives just got so busy, we haven't come to church in a long time. I'm sure we'll get back one of these days. It should probably not come as a surprise that many times those people have flattened out spiritually. Oh, you can say all day long, oh, you know, I don't have to go to church to experience God. I know, but you won't experience him. Not if you're out there just by yourself, because I'm telling you the circumstances of life, the devil will throw those at you over and over and over, and your soul begins to shrivel but you come back into the light, you come back into worship, you come back into community, and your soul begins to come to life again. Our joy is hinged upon Jesus, not upon our circumstances. Now, that's the first thing that Paul's telling us. He wants to make sure that we have that understanding. Second thing he's gonna help us to see is God wastes nothing. He wastes nothing. Now, remember what Paul's calling has always been. He's a church planter, and yet he's locked up. So they've shut him down, right? Not exactly. You do the math. As a royal prisoner chained to a different member of Caesar's personal guard, every four hours, six different men, every day for two whole years, Paul got to minister to approximately 4,380 different guards. And 
we know that some of them trusted in Christ. Some of them did become followers of Jesus. They embraced the good news of Jesus from Paul. Paul even says, he tells us this. It's really kind of clever how he does it. The very end of Philippians, when you get over to chapter four, to the very last verses, verse 21 and 22, he signs off by saying, now, before I go, just give my greetings to each of God's holy people, all who belong to Christ Jesus, the brothers and sisters who are with me, send you their greetings. And all the rest of God people send you greetings too, especially those in Caesar's household. Wink, wink. Don't you love that? He's saying, hey, this isn't what I would have signed up for, but these guards are the captive audience that God has put me here with. And so I'm sharing the good news with them and their souls are coming to life. And that's where I'm finding joy. Not in my circumstances, but in seeing that God is not wasting this time. I thought I would have surely started some more churches, but they've got me pinned up here. But that's okay. He's bringing the church to me one by one. And they're going out and they're telling other people. See, many times, friends, we can't see when we're in a circumstance that feels bad. It feels horrible. We don't like it. Get me out of here, God. We, we can't see, wait a second, maybe God actually is using you there. Consider this also, do the math. Apostle Paul got a lot of writing done. In those two years, he would write not only Philippians, he would also write the letter to Colossians. He would also write the letter to Philemon. He would also write the letter to the Ephesians. All while he was there in that two-year stint. And those letters would go out, and we're still reading them today. They've been read by millions and millions, well more than a billion or two billion people now. Don't tell Paul, you're wasting your time there. Boy, did they shut you down. No, they didn't. It was just going to be working in a way that he never saw coming, but God saw it the whole time because God wastes nothing. And I think some of you need to hear that because... I don't know, any number of you, I think many times you feel like you're a little bit in chains. You know, one of you says, you know, I feel like I'm chained to my neighbor. It drives me crazy. He's rude. I just, I, I just wish he would just, one day he'd come home and there'd be a for sale sign in his yard. And sometimes I even dream of going in the cover of night and putting one in his yard for him because I just don't like him. But I don't know, maybe God has you next to him to be the light of Christ. Oh, you might not see him convert, but maybe you're sowing seeds that God someday he'll remember you and the way that you handled him. Some of you, you feel chained up in your marriage. It just hadn't turned out like you dreamed. Your husband, your wife, it's just like, this is, this is not what I signed up for. Some of you, you feel chained maybe to, to, to uh, one of your children who's just required extra much attention, and, and help and assistance, you're like, this is not the deal I signed up for. You know, some of you, you feel chained up um, maybe in your workplace, at your job. You're like, oh, if I could just get a different job, but God never seems to be opening up a new job, so you keep going to that job, and you're like, I don't like this job, but God, how I could be useful if you'd get me out of here. You don't know, but what if God says, no, see, that's the whole thing. I've got you there so that you can be useful. I came to experience the reality of how God wastes nothing in my own life some years ago. I was in seminary, and um, one summer I signed up or I applied to be uh, what's called a chaplain in training. It's called the CPE hospital that um, a CPE program that hospitals offer to seminary students just to help round out their education. So I uh, was uh, chosen and, and, and hired at MD Anderson. That's where I would do my CPE. And MD Anderson is a, is a marvelous place, and you see so many miracles and breakthroughs. It's a very powerful... But I'm telling you, as a chaplain, you don't get to see a lot of those stories so much as you get to see the, the downsides. You, you, it, it was a heavy, heavy summer. I have fond memories of many meaningful conversations and prayer times and such with people, but, but it, just, it just was a very heavy summer in my soul because you're up there and you're dealing with real problems and real pains and you've been here, these people have been here for two and three and four and five weeks and the prognosis is iffy and, and it's all experimental, of course. And, 
But what really made it a hard summer for me was Alan. That wasn't his real name, but that's what I'll call him. He was the director of the program. He wasn't even normally the director of the program, but the real director had to go, go somewhere that summer, and so they hired him as a substitute director. And boy, he was a real old, crusty, foul mouth. I don't even think he believed in Jesus. You know, and here he's, he's, he's training us how to be chaplains. And he just oozed this cynicism and this bitterness. And um, I remember thinking, oh, this is going to be a long summer with you sitting across the table. And <clears throat> I think he felt the same way about me. Because of the six of us who were in the program, I think he took particular delight in picking on me. And I remember it... Uh, it became pretty apparent early on when he said, Ken, you, you're, not a, you're not a pastor. You're not a chaplain. You missed your calling. I'm like, no, I didn't. This is what I'm supposed to do. I know I'm supposed to do it. Let's just get through the summer and, uh, you know, and we'll both be free of each other. But, but I'd go up and I'd visit the people and I'd pray with them, cry with them, and I'd come down and there he'd be sitting in his chair and he'd swivel around and he'd look at me with that smirk. He'd say, why are you doing this to yourself? You have missed your calling. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't need this. And, and I'm thinking to myself, why did I get hired? I could have gone to Methodist or I could have gone to her. I could have gone any other place. This guy is driving me crazy. Finally, I said, okay, Alan, since you feel so clear that I've missed my calling, what do you think I should be doing? He said, politics. <laughs> he said, it's clear as a bell. You should be in law school. You shouldn't be in seminary. You are wasting your time. You should be in law school. Someday you're going to be a politician. In fact, from now on, I'm going to call you senator. <laughs> senator. And so every morning we walk in, morning chaplain, morning reverend, morning chaplain, morning reverend, morning senator, you know, and, and I mean, it just drove me crazy. And <clears throat> through the process, I, I was really beginning to wonder because there's a lot of heaviness that's going on. And, and I was really thinking, I don't think I can do this, God. And, and I did learn I, I can't do chaplain ministry, but I was kind of lumping it all together. I don't think maybe I wasn't supposed to be a pastor. And maybe I was supposed to go to law school, and I'm confused, God, and is this what you really want? No, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And, and, but then one day, the last week of the summer, God broke through. And I had a conversation with somebody, and the person said something along the lines of, I think I just heard God speak through what you just said. And I said, Really? He said, yeah, I, I really do think. And then I went to another room. And the person said, you, you just haven't any idea how much I'm going to miss your being here. Your visits every day have meant so much to me, chaplain. You've just, it's just changed my experience here. At the same time, I had signed up to, or I had said I'd speak for a youth week with hundreds of kids at another deal down in the other part of the city that week, which I never would have signed up in the frame of mind that I was in, but I had said I would do it and I couldn't cancel. And so I was going in at night and, and preaching sermons to kids and feeling life and joy again and vibrancy. And, and, and I began to notice something's coming alive in my soul again. It's coming back. I know that I am doing what I'm called to be doing. I remember I couldn't wait till the last Day when we had our closure experience, I was going to sit down for with my final one on one with Alan, and we sat down. But before I could even let him start letting his cynical words ooze out of his mouth like pus, I just jumped in and I said, Alan, I got to tell you something. He said, All right, what do you want to tell me, Senator? I said, Alan, God has made clear. Beyond all shadow of a doubt, I am supposed to be a pastor. I'm never going to be a senator. And if that disappoints you, I'm terribly sorry. But he's told me through this counter, through this encounter, through this encounter, through this encounter, I'm doing what I was made to do. I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to be a pastor. End of discussion. And I remember he sat back. 
And he looked at me with the most authentic smile that he'd ever given me all summer. And he said, well, huh. He said, I'm glad you finally figured it out, Reverend. I'm telling you, that old crusty pain in a neck was the, was the best thing for me in that season because that is the season of life when young people start wondering, am I doing the right thing? And, and God was using that whole hard summer to drive into me the clarity that I would always need and never have to backtrack from. You're called to be a pastor. This conversation is over. I'm telling you, God wastes nothing. We just have to begin to see Maybe, God, maybe you actually do have me here for such a time as this, for such a purpose as your grand and glorious purposes. Third thing, last thing, and that is get Jesus into the core of your soul and you can't lose no matter what. Get Jesus into the core of your soul and you can't lose no matter what. Paul says in verse 19, and following, look, I know that I'm going to be delivered out of here thanks to your prayers. Now, I don't know whether I'm going to be delivered out through death or if they're going to deliver me out, um, you know, walking free. But it doesn't matter because, verse 21, for me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. If I die, I get to be with him. What's bad about that? But if I live, I get to tell more people about him. And that's awesome too. I can't lose. This is why Paul had joy. One of my great joys over the last, I don't know, four or five years has come through my interaction with three people. A man named Aubrey, another guy named Don, and Don's wife, Moira. Together we formed a micro group just focused on growing in our discipleship, learning how to follow after Jesus um, more intentionally and more consistently. We would meet every Friday afternoon for an hour or two. And since all of them were in their 70s, back when we started, I named them my seven ups. And um, in fact, that's, that's, uh, that's my seven ups group. At the onset of the group, I would have described all three of them as beginners spiritually speaking, um, but they're not beginners anymore. Over the past several years, they've grown a lot. So we've studied the Bible, they've developed their own prayer lives, even learning how to pray aloud, something you could have never, they'd have never imagined themselves praying aloud in front of other people several years ago. And they've just come into an overall orientation of the reality of Christ living inside of them through the power of his Holy Spirit. But uh, about two weeks ago, our group diminished by one when Moira uh, went to be with Jesus after a long season of, of health challenges. The night before we did the funeral here, I joined Don at the funeral home and his extended family um, for the private hour before the publicized hours of visitation began. And at the end of the hour, when the other guests started um, arriving, I started to prepare to slip out. And Don pulled me up close. He said, Ken, I want you to know something. If this had happened to me five years ago, I have no idea where I'd be or how I'd be doing right now. But I've got Jesus in me now. It's going to be fine. I am fine. So thanks, Ken. And thanks for coming tonight. You go on home now, and we'll see you tomorrow at the service. That would have been awesome enough, but the clincher came when a couple of hours later, I got a text from um, one of the people who was a guest at the funeral home that night. And he said, Ken, I wish that you were here at the funeral home to hear Don sharing his faith and his love with Jesus. 
with every single person who's in the visitation line. You would be so proud. I was so proud. But I wasn't surprised. Even at the loss of his spouse of 60 years of marriage, Don wasn't crumbling in defeat, not in depression. No, he was standing tall, exuding the joy of the Lord to people coming through the line to console him. His response in the worst of circumstances said everything about his spiritual maturity, don't you realize? And so it is with you and with me. Our responses to our circumstances say everything about our maturity in Christ as well. And so Don's shouldn't be a rare exception. No, joy is available to all of us, regardless of our circumstances. To anybody who puts Jesus at the core of your soul, you can have joy, no matter what life throws at you. Because if you have him at the core, you can't lose. So my question is, do you have him at the core? Some of you say, I don't think I have him at the core. In a moment, we're going to pray, and I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to invite you. I want you to pray and say, Jesus, I want you to come into the core of my heart. I want to have what Apostle Paul had, what Don has. I need to have Jesus really inside of me. We're going to pray in just a moment. But I want to say just a brief word, one more word, to, to, to many of you who say, well, I already have done that. I did that five years or 15 or 25 years ago. I trusted in Christ, but, but I don't feel that joy so much, and I want to feel that joy. Two things for you. The first thing is, you've got to correct your understanding of, of how the gospel works. See, I'm afraid that we in American Christianity, we tend to think of the gospel as just this entry point to Christianity, just this thing that you do when you're passing through the doorway into faith. You, you hear the gospel about God becoming one of us and dying and rising, and you're like, okay, I get it, I believe it, I trust it, I have accepted Christ, done, check it off, right? No, the gospel is not a diving board that we just dive off of. The gospel is the pool that we get to swim around in, which means we've got to keep re-gospeling ourselves daily. When I sent out the email uh, to you, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday after the shooting in Florida, and my heart was so heavy. I was just sharing from, from my own devotional uh, life, my own journalings that day. What was I doing? I was re-gospeling myself. I was reminding myself, wait, this is nothing new. Cain killed Abel just outside the Garden of Eden. This is nothing new. Ours is a fallen world. But for this, we have Jesus. That's where our hope comes from. You and I, we have to re-gospel ourselves over and over and over. And I'll tell you one other thing. We have to tell other people this good news. He didn't give us this good news just to sit on it. If, it, if you just sit on it, it just starts to kind of rot in your soul. He gave it to us so that we could share it with other people. Because if you haven't thought about it, you have captive audiences in your life. You may not be strapped to them with chains like Paul was, but they're in your life. They're crossing paths with you every single day. You could put in a word for Jesus. Sometimes you even look for an opportunity. It's the reason I still go get my hair cut. I know that that doesn't make any sense. Don't judge me. So, but, but the reason that I, even the other day I was sitting there, I was thinking, this is so silly. Why do I pay $13 for this? You know, and I could do this myself. But then I realized the reason I do it still, the reason I still go there is because those dear ladies, they were with me in my times of plenty and must I abandon them in my years of famine? And so I go, I go because I've grown to enjoy them. I like being around them. I know their names. I know they, they've, this one's from Vietnam and this one's from Vietnam. I know their stories. I've heard their stories. They've heard mine. They've heard how I nearly died and how I, how, and I always tell them about Jesus. Sometimes I preach a little of the sermon to them that I'm going to do that week. And I, one of them said, I want to get a Bible. Can you help me get a Bible? Yeah. Did you ever buy anything on Amazon? Never did. I said, give me your phone. I'll teach you how to do it. We got her a Bible. Another one, I locked my keys in the car, and I said, could I borrow your car because I need to go home? That's a little clueless. And she's like, sure. The reason I still go and pay $13 for a quaff that is hopeless is because 
I've got a message. It's a message that he's put inside of me, the message of Jesus. And every time I get to tell other people about him, every time I tell the stories of Jesus, what he's done in my life, I feel the springs bubbling up inside of me, those springs of joy again. And so will you. So don't treat the gospel as something that you did way back then. No, no, the gospel is something for here and for now and for every day. And I'm telling you, if you'll go and you'll swim in the gospel and you'll get the gospel out, you'll begin to experience what Paul was talking about when he said, I have this joy that otherwise I just couldn't explain, but it has everything to do with Jesus. Let's talk to him right now. Lord, thank you for um, the good news. In our fallen world of hopelessness, it really is the only good news that's lasting. It's really the only good news that's permanent. It's really the only good news that nobody can strip from us, no matter what the circumstances of our life. It's the good news that sustains us if we would just let it. My prayer, Lord, is that each of us here, even today hearing my voice, would say, I've got to swim around in this good news more frequently. I've got to let it bubble up in my soul. I've got to get back to community and get in community and get into his word and, and get out and share the good news with some people and just tell them what God's doing in my life. Lord, I pray that you would give us the grace to do that. And then I'm praying for those here who they say to themselves, I don't think I ever invited Jesus to come into my soul in the first place. Well, right now is a good moment for you. Even while I'm praying aloud, you can just pray silently, Jesus, I am asking you to come into me and live inside of me by the power of your Holy Spirit. Won't you come in, cleanse me from my sins, purify me, give me a new start. Help me to discover a deeper sense of purpose for living that's anchored in you, the creator and the savior of the world. I want to journey with you. I want to surrender my life to you because I've run the show for all of these years and I've seen what that's gotten me. I want you now, Lord. I'm asking you, Jesus, to come in and to be the center. I want you to take over. I'm surrendering myself to you, Lord Jesus. We pray all of these things in your strong name, Lord. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Pastor Ken, who just brought part two of our series called Joy Full. Welcome, Pastor Ken. Thanks. Yeah, so part two today, Joy Through Purpose. Mm -hmm. I love how you talked about how joy is not based on our circumstances. Yes. And you actually gave several examples of circumstances in your life that led to joy, mm -hmm. that you felt joy in, that weren't necessarily they weren't fun, well, in, the fun in the middle of them. Yeah. And uh, one of the examples that you gave that we can learn from is the Apostle Paul, yeah. because he found himself in sure. many circumstances yeah. Yeah. in which you would not naturally think were joyful. Yeah. Uh, and one of those is, as you talked to, when he was in the prison yeah. in Rome. And yeah. so we had an interesting question, mm -hmm. uh, just thinking through this idea of him being in Rome and him um, preaching the gospel and speaking to everyone he came in contact. And so the question was, if Paul was actually in prison, then how did he write all the scripture? The Bible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. how did he? How yeah. did... Well, so what we know is that the, the imprisonment that he experienced this time was not the most terrible uh, dungeon-like prison, mm. which he would later get, but this was more of a house arrest, meaning um, he was still strapped up to the, to the guys all day long and night long, um, but he had some freedoms. Mm -hmm. Among those freedoms, uh, people could come and talk with him, and he could talk with them. And um, so you kind of imagine 
that maybe after a little gathering had dispersed and the people left, that mm -hmm. a guard who had been listening is saying, well, I got a question mm -hmm. about what you were just telling them. You know, and well, we got some time, let's talk about it. You know, and, and he also had the freedom to write, mm -hmm. which um, you have to remember, it's not like, uh, you know, the question arises, wouldn't they have burned uh, his letters? We have to remember, people don't understand who he was, mm -hmm. not when this was happening. Um, you know, the, the naysayers were all against him and, and trying to get rid of him as he had tried to get rid of Christian, Christians. But um, the, otherwise people are just like, eh, whatever, you, you wanna write a letter, write a letter. Uh, here's some paper, you know, and, and so it wasn't a big deal. And, but thankfully those letters were saved uh, in the churches where they'd been sent and would eventually become canonized in our scripture. It does make you wonder though, I found myself wondering what it must have been like to be one of those guards mm. uh, chained up to him as he's writing and you can't help yourself, but sort of peering over his shoulder as he writes, for me to live is Christ mm -hmm. and to die is gain. Don't you know that the guy who was strapped up to him to that day, that day surely was like, you gotta break that one out for me a little bit to kind of help me understand this. So it's no wonder that by the end of Philippians, he talks about uh, people are saying hi here, including even those <laughs> in the household of Caesar, which was the Praetorian guard. Mm -hmm. And so clearly he was being a light and it was working. Uh, with the congregation that he'd been given, even though it didn't look like what he'd always envisioned it would look like in Rome. That's awesome. Okay, so uh, we're on week two of mm -hmm. the Joyful series. Yeah. Tell me about it's coming week three. Yeah, so we're going to turn week. next week and look at what Paul writes that's going to help us in the realm of humility. Mm -hmm. There is some real joy that comes to our lives if we could get past ourselves mm -hmm. and our pride and get to humility. There's a real liberation and a freedom and a joy that comes when we can get there. Well, I look forward to hearing that. Yeah. All right, and look forward to seeing you here back next week for Postscript. Uh, thank you and have a good day. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.